Hello there, and thanks for joining us. We're really pleased to be bringing you another dinosaur sculpture. This here is the Spinosaurus Maracanus, and it walked and swam the earth approximately 100 million years ago. And it's been created with polymer clay. The building lesson will be part one, and in another lesson, part two, we will be painting our Spinosaurus. Now, we have tried to make this model as accurate as possible, taking into account all of the latest findings on this creature. But obviously, we are not paleontologists, and the onus really is just on fun. So let's get into it. In this project, we use a fair bit of stuff that is not compulsory. Namely, a banding wheel. As I said, not compulsory, but I love them, and they do make working easier. Alternatively, a plate could be used. We also use a clay press to condition our clay. You can, however, condition manually with a rolling pin. I also use some dividers to measure certain elements of the plans, but a ruler could be used, and some people I've heard use scissors. For the armature, we'll be using a 30 by 40 centimeter timber painting board for the base. Some aluminium foil, a roll of tie wire, a roll of adhesive tape, two wire coat hangers, a 3 16 threaded rod, also called a booker rod, two 3 16 nuts and matching washers, a 3 16 drill bit and a drill. We'll also be using a pair of multi-grips, a pair of flat nose pliers and some scissors. For the sculpture, we'll be using some polymer clay. These are 400 gram blocks in beige and we used one and a half packs. Some sculpting tools. This is the sculpture tool set. We won't be using all of the tools for this project, but if you really want to get into the exciting art of polymer clay sculpture, this set has everything you would ever need. A hobby knife and we'll also be using some small kebab skewers. The first step is to print out the reference material that you can find on our website, and I have printed this out to A3. We can then refer to the plans and bend the rod using pliers. The rod rises up from the panel, then a slight bend is made around the chest area. Then a right angle bend is made that will lie along the animal's backbone. The rod can then be cut around where the pelvis lies. We can then lay the plan sheet onto the painting board and centralise it. Press the point of the scissors at the area where the main support rod enters the board and drill a 3 16 hole through the front panel. You will notice the mounting hole is a little bit behind the original point. This is because I decided to put more of a forward lean to make the pose more dynamic. The booker rod can then be fastened to the board. Washers can be used between the nuts on either side of the board. These will help spread the load. We can then straighten out a coat hanger and bend this to the shape of the head to the tip of the tail. Cut it to size and bind it onto the booker rod with some more coat hanger wire. Constantly keep referring to the reference sheets to ensure that the armature lies within the perimeter of the outline. The other forelimb and two rear legs can be put in with more coat hanger wire, twisted onto the existing armature. Bend this to shape, then cut it to size. The legs and forelimb have been positioned to suggest the animal is swimming. Of course this is just speculation, and we will never really know, but most paleontologists agree that Spinosaurus was at least semi-aquatic. 
due to the crocodile-like head shape and that giant flat tail that would certainly aid in underwater propulsion. Next, we twist some tie wire back on itself and fashion five more of these. Once these are made, twist them onto the forelimb and legs. When we do this, we bend the tie wire to the edge of each side of the central wire, as they will be the left and right toe of each limb. This twisted tie wire on the coat hanger wire will also help the clay key onto the limbs. Once the wires for the limbs are bound onto the armature, position them until they look plausible in how they would articulate. Next, we fashion some aluminium foil into a ball and press it onto the underside of the armature. We do this for a couple of reasons. The first is to save on clay as if clay is too thick, cracks can form in the baking stage. Pay close attention to the plans and ensure that the aluminium foil lies inside the outline. We can then use adhesive tape to tape the alfoil to the armature. Masking tape can be used also. That is the armature stage of our Spinosaurus complete. We can now add clay for the next foundation stage of the project. Remove some polymer clay from the packet and condition it. Roll it out to a thickness of approximately five millimeters and wrap it over the armature. We ensure when we do this that the clay is flush to the armature free of any pockets of air. Blend any joints smoothly and cover the body up to where the limbs start. Then cover the tail and the head with a very thin layer of clay. If the clay is a little thick in areas, it can be paired back with the hobby knife. I lay a thin roll across the back of the animal and blend it into the body. This extra clay will help hold the spines into place when we come to insert them. Next we can put the spines of our friend into the armature. Refer to the plans and pay close attention as to how they lie on the skeleton. Push the skewers into the top of the armature and into the aluminium foil. Ensure the skewers are centralised and go in at the correct angle. Don't cut the skewers at this stage as it's best to let them set in the baked clay and we'll cut them once cured. At this stage we can put in the webbing between the toes and phalanges. This will make detailing the feet and forelimb easier in the next stage. Not a lot of fossil evidence has been found regarding Spinosaurus's feet, but if they were amphibious, it stands to reason they would have had webbing to aid in swimming. This is the foundation stage of the sculpture completed and we can bake it. We baked ours for 45 minutes at 130 degrees Celsius, making sure the oven was preheated. One trick is to turn the heat off once the time is up and open the door so that it slowly cures. Another tip is under baking can cause more problems than over baking. 
Once the sculpture is cooled, measure out each spine from the plans. Mark it with a marker and snip it to length. I used some side cutters, but some scissors would do the job too. We can then start the real sculpting and the first stage is the head. At this point, you might like to print out some extra skeletal reference material, namely top, front and side elevations of Spinosaurus's skull. It was very long, but quite thin from the top and front. Press some clay onto the head area. The idea is to apply more clay than required and carve the excess away until the shape is correct. Clay can then be added to areas like the snout, around the orbital part of the skull and any crests. Spinosaurus's skull was six feet long and like other Spinosaurids, was very crocodile-like in appearance. Carefully pare the clay away until that angled shape is achieved. Teeth are always a challenging part of any realistic sculpture. In this case, because they are so small, we decided the best option would be to snip the sharp end off the skewer and embed these into the correct position. This is quite fiddly, but once they are in position, you can straighten them and refine it all. Once the general shape is reached and the teeth are embedded, we can start to sculpt the shapes on the skull. Most dinosaurs had no muscle on the head, just hide on skull. So any indentations are actually voids in the skull. The eyes can be created by pressing a ball tool into the appropriate spot and then pressing a ball into the hollow. Now the head's done, we can apply clay over the body. At this point, we think about bone structure and how things like shoulders and hips are visible beneath the skin. We want the thickness on this second coat of clay to be around five to six millimeters thick, ideally. For the sail, we create two thin sheets and sandwich the spine between them. Press these sheets together and blend the clay at the bottom of the spines so it transitions onto the body. Spinosaurus's sail was two meters tall and it is speculated that it may have been to identify individuals. Another theory is that it was to regulate body temperature. For the legs and front limbs, we pack clay onto the armature and then carve the clay away until the legs look right. For the large muscles on the rear legs, it's best to crudely fashion the shapes and press them onto the body. We can then blend them onto the lower portion of the legs.
many areas where the skeleton would show on the surface of the animal or muscles can be added to the clay after the initial shaping has been done. The toes can be placed on top of the webbing and blended in. Press some clay over the tail and carve it away so that it tapers out to nothing at the tip. If we refer to the top view of the plans, we can see that the tail is actually quite slender from the top. Spinosaurus had a large flat tail like a giant salamander. So the best way to create this is to roll out two more sheets and sandwich the tail and then profile cut the shape of the tail. For the feet and forelimb, we can create a thin sausage and press this over each phalange. The pads can be created with little balls flattened onto the underside of the feet and front forelimb. To give an idea on just how big Spinosaurus actually was, T-Rex is estimated to have been 39 to 42 feet long, and estimates put Spinosaurus at approximately 60 feet long. In fact, they were thought to have been the largest carnivore to ever have walked the earth. Adding scale texture to the skin adds a great deal of realism to a sculpture and a really effective way to create this is to fashion a stamping tool. These are easily made by rolling out a small tube, create a convex shape at the end and use a ball tool to create a series of indentations and bake it. Each indentation will be a convex shape, so when it's pressed onto soft clay, it will produce a series of convex bumps. This stamp can then be used over the entire body. In a few artist reconstructions of Spinosaurus, I saw he had some ornamental spikes around his head. 
So we decided to add these onto that area behind the head. These can be created by rolling up little tubes and pressing them onto the sculpture and blending them in. After the spikes were on top of the sculpture, we thought some ornamentation on the underside of the head might balance it out. Don't forget to take a look around the create section while you're here. Maybe you'll uncover a whole heap of free stuff from free projects, handy tips and tricks and techniques to keep you busy. And voila. Well, thanks for watching. We hope you've enjoyed this fun lesson and hope you're inspired to maybe try your hand at sculpting your own Spinosaurus. Stay tuned because we'll be painting our friend down the track. Otherwise, have fun creating and we'll see you in the next one.